All right. Am I on? Yeah, we are. How's everybody doing? This morning, um, we knew Wesley was opening up, and he came to me and he said, "You know, when you when you get words from God and you get like this extra pressure because you feel like you have to get it right the way that He said it and all this." I was like, "Yeah, I know what you're talking about." And then he said, "He said, I wonder if if what I heard and what you're about to preach." And what everybody else is going to be doing and singing is going to line up and be the same. We don't know what everybody's going to say exactly. But we're just going to keep on worshiping because everything is right on track. Everything that we're hearing I don't want to come out heavy, but but we need to slow down. Father God, right now, we pray that we can slow down. God, slow down the racing in our minds and everywhere around us. We're ready to hear from you, and we're ready to see what you're going to do. God, we come quiet right now, and we thank you, and we love you. We anticipate something amazing right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy smoke, sorry about that. Can't promise that it won't be the last time I get choked up to today. It's, it's been a week, man. We've been in this silly series called Disruptions. <laughs> it... I don't know why we decide to preach against like spiritual warfare and and all this stuff because then you have to deal with it. It's so much easier just to not have to think about it. But I'm going to I'm going to read a verse and then we're going to read the the full story. This is the only verse that's going to be on the screen. So if you want to follow along, get your app or or you know, pull out your Bible on paper. And go to Second Chronicles, not Corinthians. Corinthians is in the New Testament. Chronicles is in the Old Testament, so it's in the first half. Go to Second Chronicles chapter 20. But I'm going to read this verse that's in the middle of this story that we're going to look at today, and I'm going to tell some other stories, and then we'll be on our way. But when I read this verse, I need you to let me know if, if you're tracking with me. And if you're online, just put it in the comments and, and they'll let me know later. I, I wish I had like a feed or something right here where it's all the comments that are coming through. It, it's fun to watch. But, but let me know if this hits you. Second Chronicles 20, verse 17, it says, You will not have to fight this battle. Let's pack up and go home. Oh, man, it, it, didn't, it didn't hit yet. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. Come on, somebody. This needs to be the verse that's above your toilet. This needs to be the verse that's, that's everywhere in your house. 
you do not have to fight this battle. We, we, put, you know, we put all those lovey-dovey things above the toilet and whatever. Like, like, let's get fierce, man. It's time where you do not have to fight this battle. Now, it might be weird going to the bathroom reading that, but... <laughs> get amped up and ready to go. What are you doing? I'm just going to the bathroom, man. That's so weird. What are we talking about? Uh, have you ever asked yourself, how in the world is this going to work? Or, or maybe you ask yourself, like, I, I see this thing coming, this storm coming, this, this thing that is going to happen, and it's going to be rough. How in the world am I going to get through this? You ever ask yourself that question? Like, if you're a parent, you've probably asked yourself this question. How in the world, like, why in the world did we do this to ourselves? Sometimes. Sometimes. Not Not me. Not me. Not, not our house. Or, or at work, and, and you got this boss that is just not my boss, though. He's sitting up front. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? How in the world am I going to get through this? How, I see this storm brewing. I see this thing coming. There is no hope. There is no way out of this. There is no way that I can do this on my own. Am I talking to anybody yet? Maybe it's parenting, maybe it's work, maybe it's marriage, maybe it's not even something physical. Maybe it's something in your mind. And maybe it's, it's just everything that we, we have no words, we have no way of understanding what's happening around us or how we're going to get through it. And then we come across a verse like this where God says, you will not have to fight this battle. Thank you, Jesus. You know, sometimes we're in a battle that seems so overwhelming. And, and, and sometimes we get in battles because of our own dumb decisions. You know what I'm talking about? Or is that just me? <laughs> sometimes, though, there, there are some battles that come upon us that we weren't expecting. And, and, and we didn't really have a choice in the matter, but yet we still have to deal with the things that are coming our way. And, and as we finish this series called Disruptions, I want to give you a title for this message. And, and the title of this message, if you're taking notes, is Focus the Fight. Focus the Fight. See, we've, we've been discussing the difference between an interruption and a disruption. And, and we said an interruption is a temporary break in what we were doing. A, a, this inconvenient thing, this... We had this plan, we were going this way, and we wanted to do this thing, yet this thing stopped us, and all we can think about is how frustrated we are because we want to get back to the way things used to be, an interruption. Contrast that with a disruption, which is a major altering moment that leaves things very different than they were before. So we're moving along, this thing happens, and yeah, we're frustrated, but then we shift our perspective. And we start to see, wait a second, this isn't just an interruption. This is something that I need to shift. This is something that I need to cause some change in my life because this is causing something that is going to leave things very different than they were yesterday. And, and so that's where we're at right now. I believe that we are in a disruption season. If, if you haven't seen that yet, open your eyes and wake up. Be, because... This is a moment where we get to decide what is our perspective going to be. Is our perspective going to be, this is an interruption, this is inconvenient, this is so frustrating, I just can't wait to get back. Or are we going to say, there's not much that I can do about this situation that we're in. There's not much that I can do about the season that I'm in. So I'm going to have to shift my perspective and I'm going to shift the way that I think and I'm going to shift the way that I do things so that I can see higher, think higher, and see further. And we, we've been through this. We said uh, interruption leads to frustration. The, the past couple weeks we said disruption leads to innovation, to transformation, to freedom, to future. And today I'm going to talk to you about disruption leads us to focus. 
And we've been on this theme this morning of, uh, am I going all over the place? Am I doing all of these things? Everything's so loud. Everything's coming at me. And, and, and we've realized, we, we've seen that when things get shut down, when things get quiet, when things start to, you know, just stop for a little bit, we start to realize, wait a second, I didn't really need all of this. I didn't really need this, this, and this. And then we get to realize when, when we're in a disruption that we get to focus because then we get to think clearly for a second when we stop and be still and say, these are the few things that I need. This is just the little bit that I need. Everything else, I don't really need that. And so we get to focus. And, and, and God gave me this word focus at the end of 2019. He said, this is your word, Cody. This is the word that I have for you for 2020. And, and it, it didn't make sense to me at the moment, but then, you know, 2020, vision, focus, it, I, I was slow, and it took me a minute to, to, to put that together. But I still believe that this is a year of focus for me. Uh, I still believe that this is a year of vision. I still believe that this is a year of creativity. We, we've seen so much creativity happen in the first seven months of this year, and we're about to see so much more. And, and the stuff that happens in 2020 is going to lead us, I think, for many, many years after this. Yeah, we're going through some stuff. We're, we're, we're having to deal with some things, and we're probably going to have to deal with some more things as we get through the year. But this year is going to be a stake in the ground where, where we're going this way, we hit this, and now we're going this way. And, and I still believe that, that this is what's happening. And, and we're all saying, I wasn't expecting this. Turn to somebody next to you. I wasn't expecting that. Put it in the chat if you're watching online. Don't touch them, though. Just tell them. God says, I still want your focus. I still want your attention. Things got quiet. Things are going to get quiet. Are you going to give me your attention now? Because I got some things to say. I got some things that I have to tell you, but you have to be still, and you have to be quiet. And so we're going to talk about this guy, Jehoshaphat, 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 however you want to say it, King J. It doesn't matter to me. This guy, he was one of those rare kings who um, actually did good for God. And, and, and he did a lot of good things. He's the king of Judah. And, and he set up a, a bunch of things to basically disciple the nation of Judah and, and teach them who the Lord is and, and worship the Lord. He cut down poles that people were worshiping and, and got rid of other gods that people were worshiping and, and set people straight. And he set up a, a great law system and put you know, really trustworthy leaders in, in good positions and had a great interview process to get those people there and, and really set the trajectory of this nation uh, in a good, good place. And then all of a sudden, like, like things are moving for this guy, and, and then all of a sudden he gets word that somebody wants to attack him, that somebody is going to go to war with him. Just out of nowhere. And he wasn't ready for it. He wasn't expecting it. And, and this battle starts coming. It's, it's one thing when you get to choose your battles because, you know, you get to get amped up. You get to, you know, eat the right stuff and do the right workouts. You know, we, we have UFC and boxing and, and whatever else you, you like to watch or, or not watch. It doesn't matter to me. But they set a date, right? Six months from now, there's going to be this fight. And so what do they do? They train for that date. They train, they eat right, they do what they need to do for that date. And, and they get things prepped. But what happens when the battle chooses you and you don't have those six months to, you know, get the nutrition that you need, get the workouts that you need, and get in prime shape for that fight? In, in mar this works in marriage. This works uh, pretty much everywhere. This advice that I'm about to give you. Pick your battles. Choose your battles. Not everything is worth fighting about. 
right? When we think about it, most of the stuff that we think is worth fighting about is not really worth fighting about. So let me tell you a story. There was one time I met a girl. I liked her. She liked me. We fell in love. We were about to get married. Her name is Megan. You know, we're getting ready for the, the wedding date. And excitement, excitement, excitement. We're getting ready. We got an apartment. We're moving things in. All this stuff. You know, everything's just happy. Everything's perfect. Blah, 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 yuck stuff. <laughs> One time in Elevate, I'm going to tell you a bunch of stories. I'm going to be all over the place. One time in Elevate, I said, I am the most romantic person I know. And there was a new girl that night, and she just said, who does this guy think he is? And somebody had to tell he's joking because he's not the most romantic person. So we're getting everything ready, and, and we're starting to move. She moves into the apartment before I do, um, and so we, we're moving things in. And I grew up believing, knowing to be true, written in stone, that medicine and Band-Aids and all that stuff belongs in the kitchen. <laughs> Megan, bless her heart, <laughs> grew up with this weird theology of medicine and Band-Aids staying in the bathroom. And so remember, I'm young and dumb, everything's happy-go-lucky, and, and I'm moving the box in, it's labeled medicine into the apartment, and, and I'm heading to the kitchen. And she says, what are you doing? I said, medicine belongs in the kitchen. And you know, I'm like, I'm king of this new castle, I gotta mark my territory and say, <laughs> what's up? One time, at a different house, somebody knocked on our door and greeted, they were trying to sell something, and they greeted me with, are you the king of this castle? And I was like, heck yes, I am. <laughs> and the medicine belongs in the kitchen. <laughs> so I don't remember everything that happened during that unpacking session and, and everything like that. What I do remember, though, is when I needed some ibuprofen, I was walking to the kitchen. Come on. The problem is, remember, I'm young and dumb. I had won the battle, but Megan is so much smarter than I am. Because, because now, today, when, when I need some ibuprofen, <laughs> I'm walking to the bathroom. <laughs> I had won the battle. But somehow she had won the war. I don't know how it happened. It, ju it just happened. What, what do you do when you're not expecting a battle to show up? When you're, when you're expecting to put medicine in the kitchen, but it ends up in the bathroom? Now that's a silly battle and, and whatever, but Jehoshaphat had some peaceful years and, and happy years, and, and he's doing all this really cool stuff, and then all of a sudden he gets word that this enemy has banded together with other surrounding countries, and they want to fight this guy. It says this, starting in verse 1 of chapter 20 in Second Chronicles, it says, After this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and some of the Meunites came to rage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told him, A vast army is coming against you from Edom. Verse 3, Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. I love this verse. You need to highlight this verse, underline this verse, whatever you need to do to remember it. Alarm, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. This is interesting. I'll come back to it in a second. But, but King Jehoshaphat, he, he had wealth, he had honor, he had power, he had everything that he could want. He, he did good in the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord blessed him because of that. Like, even his enemies were bringing him treasures and gifts and all of this stuff. So much so that Jehoshaphat built cities in Judah just to store all of his stuff. 
I'm not talking about a, a storage shed or something that we take our extra things to. Like he built entire cities. You hear what I'm saying? This dude was blessed. In this, it says, alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. Jehoshaphat knew what he needed to do. He didn't allow his provision or anything to get in the way of his direct relationship with who God is to him. He didn't allow money or fame or anything like that to allow him to forget where everything actually came from. And in other translation, that word alarmed, it says afraid, it says terrified, it says scared. You know, it's okay to be those things. It, all that matters is, is what is the next step after that feeling? What is, what is the next thing that you're going to do after you feel that fear? Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. Like, when I picture this, I think Jehoshaphat is like, oh dear. Like when he got that, that message, oh dear, I know what we're going to do. And then he goes and prays and all this. In Elevate, we teach this one thing, especially during our dating series. We teach that you need to decide what you're going to do before you get in the situation that you're going to be in. And this works everywhere. And, and God gave me some words for this just last night. He, he was talking to me and, 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 and he put it in this way. He said, decide before you're tried. Decide before you're tried. And this works more than just dating. But, but decide what you're going to do before the temptation comes. Decide what you're going to do before the trial comes. Decide what you're going to do before and this is what Jehoshaphat does. Because he's been in some situations where he, he almost made the right choice, but then for some reason still went with it. He, he teamed up with this king Ahab. And, and Ahab was the one where uh, Elijah came and, and just bust into his meeting and said, no more rain until I say so. And, and, you know, he called fire from heaven. It's that king Ahab. And so he teams up with this guy. And Ahab wanted to go fight somebody and uh, wanted Jehoshaphat to go with him. And so Jehoshaphat says, I'll, I'll team up with you, but we need to ask the Lord, are you in this? What, what should we do? And Ahab says, I got it covered. I got 400 prophets. They'll come tell us if we're supposed to go. And so they have all 400 come in, and the 400 say, oh, yeah, go fight them. You're going to win. You're going to do this. And Jehoshaphat is sitting there thinking, something ain't right. How, how are all 400 of these prophets telling you to go do this? And it turns out that Ahab is like paying these prophets to just say what he wants to hear. And Jehoshaphat says, is there not a prophet of the Lord in this place? Like, like something is not right. And then they find one, and that prophet comes in, and, and Ahab's like, oh, this guy never says anything nice about me. He never says anything good, so I just don't listen to him anyway. And for some reason, Jehoshaphat goes along with fighting, almost gets killed. Ahab does get killed because of this battle and this whole thing. So I think that moment was a, a learning opportunity for the king to, I, I need to, even though there's only one saying, don't do this, and there's 400 saying, oh yeah, go ahead and go do this, I'm going to listen to what the Lord has to say, even though it's not popular. And, and so Jehoshaphat is saying, I'm going to decide this, I'm going to uh, inquire of the Lord to see what's happening. Because when we get bad news, all we think about is, oh no, what's going to happen? I need to do this. I need to store these things. I need to get this right. I need to do this. I'm freaking out, man. I need to post this on Facebook so everybody knows that I'm freaking out right now. Or can we just, God, what you got to say about this? And that's what he does. So everybody from Judah comes they seek the Lord together. We're talking a lot of people. And Jehoshaphat stands up in front of everybody, and he begins to pray. And this is verse 6 of chapter 20. It says, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. 
our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And he keeps going and he says, you know, they, they went through this land that you gave us as an inheritance. And, and, and there was these few nations that, that you didn't allow us to fight at the time. And because we didn't take them out back then, they're starting to turn on us now. And they think they're going to take this land that you had promised to us, that you had given to us. Verse 10, it says, But now here are the men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Verse 12, Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. In other words, we see this thing coming. We're not strong enough. There's no hope in this situation. Look at the second half of 12. We do not know what to do. How many times have you heard that in the last six months? We don't know what to do right now. But our eyes are on you. So what happens? King says, let's gather everybody together. No more eating. No more anything. We're going to focus this thing. We're coming together as a nation. And and we're bringing all of our attention on this moment right now. We're going to humble ourselves. We're going to pray. And we're going to seek after the face of the Lord. There was a time um, we take our students to a conference called Momentum every year, and we were in Chicago this year, Um, and not this year, the year that I'm telling about. And, and, you know, we have great speakers and, and things throughout the week, and then the last day, everybody in the conference goes out into the community and does different things. You talk to people, you pray with people, you do different projects at nonprofits and things like that. Um, We were supposed to go to one, but I didn't like it, so I decided to go somewhere else, take our group somewhere else. And we went, we we were planning to go to a park um, because, you know, summer, there's kids out, we can talk to families, and we've had good experience with that. And so we get ready, we go to this park, um, kind of without permission from who we needed permission for. I asked for forgiveness, it's okay. And, and so as we're driving to this park in Chicago somewhere, um, we arrive and, and we don't see anybody. We're in a school bus, we don't see a place to park, which is something that we need, and we don't see a person, like nobody is there. And I'm freaking out, and I'm thinking, oh shoot, I should have asked permission, I should have done this, blah, 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 blah. And, and so here's what we do. I know this sounds super spiritual, and I don't mean it to sound spiritual, but I turn around on the bus, and I said, all right, everybody, start praying. Start praying that people show up and we get a parking spot. And, and there's something very cool about a packed school bus with people praying on it that just sounds so awesome. And so we're driving around. Everybody's praying. We're looking. We're looking. We're looking. They're praying. They're praying. They're praying. Probably about 15, 20 seconds into to praying, we, we make a turn. And when we turned, we saw hundreds, probably a couple thousand people at this park. Like we literally saw nobody anywhere. And then we make one turn and there are thousands of people. And it turns out that there was a high school reunion happening at the park that we were at of one of the local high schools there. Not just a high school reunion for, you know, like last year's graduates. I'm talking a high school reunion of every graduate in that high school from like 1960. And, and there were so many people there, 
and we found a parking spot. And so we get off, and we get, and as soon as we got off, I mean, everybody's having conversations with everybody. I mean, they're cooking fried chicken everywhere, and like, so we're sharing Jesus and chicken, and it was awesome. And, and when I hear this story and see the story, I think back to that moment in Chicago where humble yourself and pray, quiet things down, and, and I will handle this for you. You're not going to see anything at all until you ask me for it. You're not going to see anything happen, but if you ask me, I will send you a thousand people from a high school union with a lot of good chicken. When we see storms coming, when you're in the middle of a storm, let's not just be interested in getting past our problems. Let's be more interested in standing and staying in the will of God. I, I don't think that God is as interested in our occupation as we think he is. I think God is more interested in, are you in my will? It's one of the, the most common questions we get. How do I know I'm in the will of God? Here it is. Worship him with everything that you have. When you worship God with everything that you have and everything that you are, no matter what you're doing or where you're at, you're in the will of God. So, so we're not just praying, God, get me past this problem. Get me past this inconvenience. Get me past this thing. God, what is it that you're teaching me? What is it that you're showing me? What is it that you want for me in this moment? God, everything that I have is yours. I know who you are. I've seen you deliver before. I've seen this, and, and, and you've done this. Now just do it again in me. And, and don't just take this thing away. God, I want to do what it is that you have for me in this moment. Verse 13, it says, All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Jehoshaphat, just he gets done praying. And we see that this is, this is a family affair, man. This is everybody. When, when we first had this lockdown and every, we had to shift things and, and then we were talking about, you know, coming back and what are we going to do with kids? We're like, bring them in the room. Bring them in. I, I see a few in here. They're watching online. Let me tell you something. Our kids pick up more than we think. My wife, Megan, she, she fills our house with an aroma of some great cooking. She also fills our house with an aroma of worship. And she is always playing worship music. Whenever I leave or, or I'm coming home or, or whatever, there's always worship music playing. And, and there's this new song by Elevation Worship called Rattle. And it's just like this raw, raw. Like if you're about to go to battle and you know you're about to go to battle, like put this, you, you got to run like 10,000 miles. Put this song on. You'll be all right. You got to slay like 100 dragons. Like it's just this hardcore song. And, and she plays it all the time. And Riley, my five-year-old daughter, she'll look at me because we know when this song comes on, Megan's about to get her worship on, and it's about to get crazy. <laughs> and so we look at each other, and Riley says, oh, I hear that song. Mommy's about to get crazy. <laughs> and so, you know, she's like, whatever. She's cooking at the same time and just doing her thing. And, and there's this part where it's just like shouting over and over and over, and do it now, do it now, do it now talking about miracles and and so Caleb our, our two-year-old son he'll just be running around the house sometimes and he'll be like do it now do it now do it now do it now my point is they pick up more than we think my point is you pick up more than you think Sometimes we, we're reading the Bible or something like that, and it's like, this doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand what I'm reading. It's okay. Just keep reading. 
it's going to nourish you. Probably you don't remember what you had for breakfast two weeks ago. It still nourished you. And, and there's going to be times when you're like in the conversation and, and just a verse is going to come out or, or a principle is going to come out and you're like, how did I know that? It's because you stayed faithful to the word. You stayed faithful to hearing what he has for you. I don't understand this. That's okay. Just keep reading. Ask questions. God loves our questions. Jehoshaphat just asked him a ton of questions in this prayer. And so they're all waiting in this moment. All the families listening, what is going to happen now? And Jehaziel, don't know who this guy is, maybe some random guy in Judah. But Jehaziel, his name means God sees. And he speaks up. And he says, this is what God is saying. In verse 15, it says, listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be, def- be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. That's a good word. And immediately, Jehoshaphat gets down on his knees and starts praising the Lord. And everybody else starts following Everybody else in Judah is worshiping the God because of this great word. It's easy to praise and worship and give thanks when you have some good news come that way. But there's still a battle about to happen. There, there's still something about to happen. And, and, and God is saying, I want you to show up. Like, I want you to put your armor on. I want you to, to stand in front of the enemy. I want you to not just cower back. But you're not going to have to lift a finger if you show up, if you take a stand, if you take your position. And they're worshiping. And, and Jehoshaphat doesn't sleep at all that night. You wouldn't either. I wouldn't either. Is this really going to happen? Is this what it's going to be? Verse 20, early in the morning, they left for the desert. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. Listen to what the Lord has said, and you'll be all right. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat did something ridiculous that does not make sense and shouldn't have happened, yet it did. He appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, singing, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. I'm all for worship. I love our worship team. But slaying on a guitar is different than slaying in war. Like, like Jarrett can really get it. TJ can, can, they'll play till their fingers bleed. But it doesn't make sense to put them at the front of the army when we're about to attack somebody. Like, like put them in the back. You can keep a drum beat from the back. But Jehoshaphat says, let's do something crazy. Let's put them in the front. Let's start this war with praise. Let's start this, pr- this war with worship and see what God will do. And so they put these people in the front and they just start singing. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And they're just singing the song and worshiping and worshiping. Verse 22, as they began to sing in praise, they're marching up to war, they're singing praise, they're worshiping God. The Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. The guys that were invading Judah 
and they were defeated. The Lord set ambushes. Do you know what an ambush is? Like, it means that things were already set in place. Things were already hiding. Things were already just waiting for the call to pull the trigger. Just waiting for that signal to say, it's go time. And you know what that signal was? Our prayers, our worship, and our singing. The Lord already had it in place. He was just waiting. Are you going to go out to this impossible situation? Are you going to get dressed and take your positions into a situation that seems hopeless? And are you going to worship me? Are you going to trust me? Are you going to see that I won't deliver on the promise that I just gave you? That you will not have to fight this battle and that you will be victorious because this battle is not yours. This battle is mine. All we have to do is take the step of faith and say, God, I'm trusting your word. I'm trusting your promise. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be discouraged. I'm going to keep stepping forward. Listen to this. Your breakthrough begins the moment you stop being impressed by the size of your problems. Your breakthrough begins the moment you stop being impressed by the size of your problems. What is it that you're seeing that seems so impossible, that seems so big that it's never going to go away, that seems that you're never going to be able to get around it or away from it? Your breakthrough begins the moment you stop being impressed by the size of your problems that you're facing. Because the Lord has already surrounded your enemy and he's just waiting for the call. He's just waiting to be activated. He's just waiting for you to hit the button. When the men of Judah, verse 24, came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast storm. This is so funny. Think about this. They don't even see the enemy yet, and they're praising, they're worshiping, they're doing this. When they see the, the, the enemy, the vast army, all they saw was dead bodies lying on the ground. Like, think about this. You're coming over the crest, uh, uh, and you know you're about to see something impossible and hopeless, and, and how are we going to do this? And, and when you peek around that, that corner, and everybody's just laying on the ground, What, what kind of sight is this? This really worked. What in the world did you do, God? Luckily, he tells us. Jehoshaphat, all the men, they went off and they carried off their plunder. They found from among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value. More than they could take away. They had to leave some things behind. They took the iPhones and the iPads and they left all the Androids back. <laughs> Sorry. There was so much plunder it took three days to collect it. On the fourth day, they assembled at this valley and they praised the Lord again. Then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joy joyfully to Jerusalem for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lyres and trumpets. The fear of the Lord came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they had heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. It's time to focus our fight. It's, it's time for us to get still to get quiet. It's time for us to get back to our true identity. Because when, when we have Christ living in us, and we have said, Jesus, you are everything to me, he washes us clean, and we become a new creation, and that creation is designed for worship. That is who we are. That's what we do. We give thanks and praise before we see the victory of the war. 
We give thanks and praise before we see the breakthrough happen in our life. So maybe, if I can give you some homework this week, here's what I would love to see happen. I would love to see my Facebook feed, my Instagram feed, Twitter if you're still on there, blown up with pictures of lists of everything that you're thankful for. We started asking this question this week at dinner. What's one thing you're thankful for? Just one thing. It doesn't have to be anything huge. Riley said she's thankful for her little Bambi stuffed animal. You could be thankful for your kitchen table. You could be thankful for Wi-Fi. Because when you start to change the perspective, you start to shift your focus, and you start to focus the battle to thank you, Lord, for everything that you have given me. Thank you, Lord, that, yeah, we might be up against this battle. We might be seeing some things that are coming our way. But God, I'm thankful for the chair that I sit in. I'm thankful for the air that I breathe. So let me give you some homework. You can tag the church and however all that works. But put things on there that you're thankful for, that are positive, And start to shift the focus of this battle that we're in. And, and let's see what, what might happen to the algorithms out there. It's time to focus our fight. I want to pray over you and those of you watching online, and then uh, we'll do communion and all that. If, if it's appropriate, with the person that you're next, put your hand on their shoulder. If not, put your hands out. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we don't have to fight every battle. That, that we are in your will when we are worshiping you. God, we come right now. We humble ourselves and we pray and we worship. God, heal our land right now. Heal our minds right now. Heal our relationships right now. Lord, we give you thanks in advance for everything that you're about to do, for everything that you have done. Heavenly Father, we praise you, we thank you, and we love you. Jesus, thank you for coming to this place, showing us what it means to live as a follower of you, for dying on the cross and giving us new life so that we can start eternal life right here, right now. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.